So we're going to start today in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9. And we're not going to go through the whole thing. I'm going to have to make this a part one and part two. Because those last couple of verses are just so packed with so much. Verse 24 to the end of the chapter, verse 27, that there's just not enough time to get into that. And I want to do it right. And uh, so I'm going to try to do that next week. And we'll get into that. That's the 70th week of Daniel. But today we'll, we're going to look at just the first part of the chapter. And the outline of Daniel chapter 9 is Daniel's prayer and confession, verse 1 through 19. Verse 20 through 23, the angel Gabriel, or archangel, appears to help Daniel to understand. And then verse 24 through 27 is the prophecy of the 70 weeks, which is still future, part of it. I can't believe how many people are coming out of the woodwork saying, nope, that's already passed. <laughs> he even says, this will befall you in the later days. Do they even read their Bible? I, just, I don't understand. But that's what we'll look at next week, because I really want to focus some time on that. So today, we need to start in Numbers chapter 14, because I forgot to read this last week. I can't believe I did. So, or not, not last week, but the last before uh, when I was here. And I told you all that 2,300 days, I said it was 2,300 years. And I don't know if you were like scratching your head going, where should you get this from, taking days and turning it into years. I meant to read that verse. So let me do that because this will apply to next week too. Because he says, you know, 70 weeks. Well, it's a week of years, not a week of, of like we say, days. But uh, Numbers chapter 14, verse 33 and your children shall wander in the wilderness for 40 years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. And when I was in Israel, we went to the wilderness. We drove around the wilderness of sin. It's called Zin, Z-I-N, but it's also pronounced S-I-N because they're sin. And man, that was crazy. I just, everywhere we went, I'm just like, how on earth would you live in a place like there's nothing? But there's lots of crevices and canyons, so there's lots of shade if you walk down there and get out of the sun. And there were a lot of plants called caper plants. Have you ever had a caper? Mm -hmm. You know what a caper is? It's kind of like an olive, but it's real small. So there were things, and we went up to the ascent of Akrabim or something, I think it's called. And it was a very interesting place because God tells Israel, your land, start right here from this hill in the middle of nowhere. And over that way is your land, and over this way is your land. It was just amazing to be there in this wilderness. But it says in... Um, in this verse 33, until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness, after the number of the days in which ye search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. So, a lot of times God says a day, and then He makes that now this is going to be a year. So, a year for a day. So, last time we looked at the 2300 days, right? That prophecy. And I don't know, but you were probably thinking, where is he getting years out of these days? Well, that's why. Sometimes God says this many days, and it applies to that many years. Okay? So I wanted to make sure I said that, because I totally meant to read that the last time we were here, and I completely forgot. So I hate to forget things, but it's kind of good to mention it now, because when we study next week, we'll be looking at this, and it's a week of years. So God always has um, the truth, and He always has a way of talking, and uh, Oftentimes, the Bible, it's always a double application. That's what's so amazing. So all these people, it's just past, there's no future. No, it's both. Part of it was back there, some of it's still to come. And we wouldn't know that without the book of Revelation. So always remember how important the book of Revelation is, and it goes with the book of Daniel. You need to always read those together because that proves still in the future. All right, so we looked at the outline. So chapter 9 deals with Israel. And it begins with what's called a lamentation. Have you ever heard of a lamentation? Mm -hmm. Now, there's a book in the Bible called the Book of Lamentations. And guess who wrote it? The guy Jeremiah. Now, remember last time we looked at, Daniel said, well, I was reading through the Book of Jeremiah. And I understood something. Okay, well, so Daniel was getting something from Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was a prophet that prophesied of some things. And he also, he was lamenting the fact that Israel was so far gone. And that's what happened to Israel is they went into captivity. And that was God's judgment on them for falling into apostasy. So let's turn over to Lamentations chapter 1. Lamentations, of course, is after the book of Jeremiah. And Lamentations is Jeremiah basically crying 
for what Israel has become. And you know what that sounds like to me? Let me, maybe you've seen this before, maybe you haven't. But when you spell out the word Jerusalem, what do you see? Jer Usa Lamb, right? And so America, whenever I think of America, or whenever I think of Israel, I think of how America has a lot in common with that nation. And when I see him lamenting for his nation and what they've become and knowing that God's judgment's about to fall, I can't help but think of our country and knowing what it's become. And it's the same sins that Israel did. So is God in heaven going, well, I, I judge them, but I won't judge America? No, he's like, I'm going to judge America because America is probably worse than they were. <laughs> Way worse. So let's go to the book of Lamentations. Let's just get a, a feel for the book and read just a little bit here. Lamentations chapter 1, verse 1 through 8. How doth the city sit solitary that was full of people? What city is this? Jerusalem. Because remember, was it Nebuchadnezzar, I think, that came in and, and laid it desolate? How is it she become as a widow? She that was great among the nations and princesses among the province, excuse me, and princess among the provinces, how has she become tributary? She weepeth sore in the night, and her tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she hath none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They are become her enemies. Now you're reading this about Israel, but just think, if this applies to America, all our allies, they're going to turn on us. I think that'll probably happen. Judah has gone into captivity because of affliction and because of great servitude. Hmm. She dwelleth among the heathen. She findeth no rest. All her persecutors overtook her between the straits. The ways of Zion do mourn because none come to the solemn feast. All her gates are desolate. Her priests sigh. Her virgins are afflicted. She is in bitterness. Her adversaries are the chief, her enemies prosper, for the Lord hath afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children are gone into captivity before the enemy. And from the daughter of Zion, all her beauty is departed. Her princes are become like hearts, that's a deer, that find no pasture, and they are gone without strength before the pursuer. Jerusalem remembered in the days of her affliction and of her miseries all her pleasant things that she had in the days of old when her people fell into the hand of the enemy and none did help her. The adversary saw her and did mock at her Sabbath. Jerusalem hath grievously sinned. Therefore she is removed. All that honored her despise her because they have seen her nakedness. Yea, she sigheth and turneth backwards. Her filthiness is in her skirt. America is a joke in the eyes of the world today because the people in charge can't even speak. Isn't that true? Yes, yeah, that's true. Right? Did, you, did you hear the, the latest one? Totally. I want to be your president because I, I'm going to work for you 365 days a week. <laughs> that's what he said. That's what that dude said. So he's not all there. And because of that, I call him the naked emperor. <laughs> he thinks he's, you know, oh, anyway, if you know that story, that he thinks that, you know what that is? You know what that is? The naked emperor, they came to him and said, we made this, this clothes and there was nothing. It was invisible. And he believed them and put them on and everyone believed he had beautiful clothes, but he's naked. And some guy goes, why are you naked? And they're like, shh, don't tell them. Don't. They had him deceived. They deceived him into thinking everything was all right. Everything is not all right with America. It's sad. The story is the king's new clothes. The king's new clothes is the name of that story. Look that up. It's pretty interesting. So, uh, skip down to verse 16 through 18 real quick. For these things I weep. Mine eye, mine eye runneth down with water because the comforter that should relieve my soul is far from me. My children are desolate because the enemy prevailed. You remember that old commercial where it was about somebody was littering and then they showed an American Indian and he just a tear going down because oh, yeah. he cried for his country. Yeah. That's nothing compared to the day. But let me ask you this. Have you ever cried over your country? Have you ever shed tears because you see how awful America is becoming? I felt very depressed. Yeah, we all feel depressed. Verse 17, Zion spreadeth forth her hands, and there is none to comfort her. The Lord hath commanded concerning Jacob that his adversaries should be round about him. Jerusalem is as a minstress woman among them. Now, I'm not going there, but that's <laughs> interesting. But you know, that's, God mentions that sometimes. Wow, well, don't say, maybe we shouldn't go there, except for the fact that I have to go there in Isaiah. Remember what he says? All your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And people say, well, in the Hebrew, that's a menstruous rag or something like that. But do we need to go there? No, we don't. But I'm just saying, 
It's funny how God looks at people and what he says. Now, what does that remind you of? Why does a woman have that? Because of the first sin, the sin of Eve. If Eve hadn't sinned, we'd all, well, we wouldn't be here, would we? But somebody said, where would, where would men be without Eve? In the garden having a time, right? Uh, but then we probably wouldn't be here because we need Eve to have babies. But uh, it's interesting how God looks at things. And if you're a woman, this, this might mean more to you, you know, how a certain time of the month you just feel really dirty. Well, God is saying to Israel, you're a woman. Remember that? She's a princess. And God says, you just, you're filthy to me. You're, you're polluted. The Lord is righteous, verse 18, for I have rebelled against his commandment. Here I pray you all people and behold my sorrow. My virgins and my young men are gone into captivity. Now verse 21 and 22. They have heard that I sigh. There is none to comfort me. All mine enemies have heard of my trouble. They are glad that thou hast done it. Thou wilt bring the day that thou hast called, and they shall be like unto me. Let all their wickedness come before thee, and do unto them as thou hast done unto me for all my transgressions. For my sighs are many, and my heart is faint. So this is interesting because he's lamenting what happened to Israel, but he's confessing the sin of Israel. We have sinned. We've done wrong. But then he says, when you judge us, Lord, make sure you judge those people that judge us. <laughs> We just read, you know, the whole book of Daniel so far, and what was it? Here comes Nebuchadnezzar to judge Israel, then God judges him. Then the Persians take over, and God judges them. It's just like a never-ending cycle. The judgment guy goes, okay, you go get him. And then they do, and they do wrong. God goes, okay, you go get him. And then it just keeps going like that. Isn't that crazy? So maybe they should just do right. It would be the best thing. So the enemies of Israel shall fall, it says, and Babylon fell. The Medes and the Persians, they fell to Alexander the Great. I firmly believe that the United States of America will fall someday because of their sin. And so read the book of Lamentations and think of the USA and pray for the United States of America. All right? Now, let's go to Daniel chapter 1. And Daniel has quite an amazing life. Or excuse me, chapter 9, verse 1. Daniel has an amazing, amazing life. He gets to meet so many of these world rulers that today we remember as some of the greatest world leaders in the history of mankind. And he got to live through and see all these guys. So he got to hobnob with the big wigs is how they say it, right? And uh, he got to witness to them in a way of pointing them to, you know, the Old Testament Jehovah. Now, Daniel chapter 9 and verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, well, I've heard that pronounced so many different ways. <laughs> it's Ahasuerus is the way I say it. That sounds best to me. And the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of, of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer the supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So because there was the prophecy of Jeremiah, Daniel says, by reading that, I understood there's going to be this 70-year thing. Well, we're looking at the 70-year thing today, but next time we're going to look at the 70 weeks thing. Remember, God always uses numbers, and often 70 or, or 7. 7 is the number of completion. So Daniel's reading the book of Jeremiah, and he's like, oh, that's what that prophecy applies to. Now, he's in the first year of King Darius, which is about 538 B.C., so he's about right here. And he understands something. What do you think he understood? Well, Jeremiah was written somewhere between 626 and 586 B.C., but he lived during the time that he saw the desolation. So he must have been alive. So it's got to be somewhere in between here, somewhere around that time, because he saw how they made desolate his city. And let's go to Jeremiah chapter 25, because what do you think Daniel read that helped him understand some things? Well, this is my best guess. Maybe, maybe it could be some other verses that, that he got a hold of, but these are the most um, pertinent ones that, that apply to his situation. Jeremiah 25, 11, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. And it shall come to pass, when seventy years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon 
and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity, and the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it a perpetual desolations. So here's God saying to Jeremiah, they're going to go here, but they're only going to be 70 years until God starts to do something again with the Jews. And we see that with the first decree to go and start to rebuild the temple. But there are a lot of different decrees, and it's not really till this one that they rebuild the city of Jerusalem. So they start with the temple, then they build the city. So this uh, next time, what we're looking at, the 70 weeks, it looks like it starts with this. But there's a lot of years between here and here. So God starts to do something with somebody, but doesn't really get the best part done until some years later. And if I remember right in my notes, somebody do the math from here to here. I think that's 91 years. So God lets them go into captivity for 70 years, but it takes 91 years before they get their city back. That's a lot of time. That's... That's not Daniel. He didn't live that long. He didn't have any children, but whoever had children, it was like their great grandkids or grandkids got to see the city rebuilt. So sin can affect multi generational things. What your great 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 granddaddy did can still affect you. Isn't that crazy to think about? You better do right because you might be messing up somebody else's life. You ever think of that? I do. Um, but what an amazing thing that he talks about. The, then God will punish the king of Babylon and he will make the land of the Chaldeans a perpetual what desolation. Have you ever been over to that part of the world? It's a perpetual desolation. There's another uh, verse in the Bible that talks about foxes will be everywhere in the land. And people have gone over there where Babylon was. There's, there's not really much, but there's foxes, wild foxes run out, just like the Bible says. So perpetu it used to be the greatest kingdom on earth. And now, hardly anything there. Isn't that amazing? Just like the Bible says. Now go to Jeremiah 29, verse 4 through 10. Here's another passage. Jeremiah 29, 4. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon, build ye houses, and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives, and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that ye may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there, and not diminished. And then it says, And seek the peace of the city, whether I have caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Let not your prophets or your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which ye cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. So, Seventy years from when they went into captivity, and we looked at this, this date, and we looked at another date, five-something, and 70 years shows up, and it takes us to around this time when it was exactly 70 years. I forget the date exactly. Go back and watch the other video. Amen. <laughs> You'll know what I'm talking about. But that's when God began to visit them and began to set things in motion to where they would go back. Now, if you want to learn about it, go to the book of Nehemiah and the book of Ezra in the Bible. And I always get those two confused. One of them rebuilds the temple, the other rebuilds the city. And I always confuse which one does what. But it's all starting to go back and starting to rebuild. You know what takes a while to build a city? It takes a long time. You don't just build one overnight. So he's understanding this as he's reading through the book of Jeremiah. And I'm sure he got excited. But what were those false prophets? They were probably telling him, no, you can go back to Israel today. <laughs> and no, you couldn't. You had to wait for the Lord's timing. And sometimes we don't like the Lord's timing, do we? I don't remember reading this verse, and I don't think I put it in my notes. But you remember the verse that talks about, I think it's one of the Psalms, where it says, In the rivers of Babylon we sat down and we wept when we remembered Zion. That's a song. Did you know that? They made that, the hippies made a song out of that. So imagine what's going on over there. Remember, Daniel was in Babylon and he wasn't alone. So he must have had other Jews there. There was probably a synagogue there. And they would literally weep for their city and their country. And eventually their grandkids got to go back. You know how blessed you are to be in this country? When you get a chance, watch the video that I did there in South Carolina. I got to preach the 4th of July message. And 
We have freedom still, even though it's eroding away. But do you know how blessed you are to live in this country? You ought to be thankful and you ought to love it so much that you weep and, and cry over what's happening in our nation. Because our nation is going to hell in a handbasket. And what do we have? We have people in charge that don't know their head from the rear end. I'll just be honest. And they're not here to make it better. They're here to destroy it on purpose. I believe that they're, it's by design they want to destroy our country because that's what socialists and communists do. And I think it's because they hate God. And that's what it is. So if we love God, we should weep over what we see taking place. So back to, um, yeah, I got 536 to 445, if you did the math, was 91 years. So God went back to dealing with them 70 years, just like he said. But it took 91 years before the city was completely rebuilt. That's a long time. So imagine the people that finally got to go back and move in. Their, their grandfather and great-grandfather talked about how they used to live there and how great it was. Do you think it was as great when they rebuilt it? So they're all living off their past former glories and the stories of their former glory. Kind of, kind of like us. We remember the American Revolution and all those stories and how great it was whenever Washington was, was president. And, and all the, but it's not like it used to be, is it? Kind of sad. Okay, I've gone too much into that. So Daniel chapter 9 and uh, verse uh, 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face in the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So he prayed. He's probably weeping too. And this is a peculiar thing. He says he's fasting but he sat in sackcloth and ashes. Have you ever done that? Um, sackcloth and ashes. Uh, sackcloth is awful. Have you ever seen a burlap bag? Rub that on your skin and see how that feels. So you get the most uncomfortable material and you put that on and you burn a big old pile where there's nothing but ashes and you go sit on that. And the Jews would do that when they pray and they'd throw the ashes on their head. And that was a custom of them. And I guess it showed how repentant they were. Because it kind of is humbling to do that. I did that one time in my life. I did something stupid I wish I'd never done. And so I went out back. I burned a huge pile of leaves. And I took an old shirt that was my dad's that I loved because it was like his football jersey or something. And I put that on as my sackcloth because it was being eat up by moss and stuff. And I sat there and I just threw it on my and I just prayed. <laughs> and it's kind of humbling because those ashes kind of hot on your butt, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but um, it was, it, I don't know why they did this or how this custom came along, except I'm thinking of a guy named Job, maybe because they wanted to be like Job. But he's sitting there and he's probably looks really dumb to these Babylonians or Medes and Persians or these people. Like, well, what is that guy doing sitting in ashes, throwing stuff on his head? <laughs> and why isn't he eating anything? So it really is a sign of contrition, isn't it? Have you ever done that? Anybody else ever done that? No. Wow. Well, maybe you should. Maybe God will save America if you do that. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, it says, And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made confession. So what is he doing? What is he confessing? We're about to see he's confessing the sin of his people, just like Jeremiah confessed the sin of his people. And if we did that, we'd be here all day, wouldn't we? Because America has a lot of sins. And it, say, it says that he said, And said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. So these people are 70 years in Babylon, away from the land that was promised to them. Do you think that gave them a longing and a yearning to go back? But 70 years is nothing. <laughs> they rejected the Messiah. Now it's 2,000 years. And over that 2,000 years, boy, all they wanted was to come back. And they got to. They got to come back in about 1947-48. So, seven years of desolation. And they return in 536 to begin building. When it's built, it's no longer desolate. But what was built? Well, it was the decree to re restore or rebuild the temple. And so, before the city gets to be rebuilt, who's thought of first? God. They didn't just go and build the city and say, oh, we'll build a temple later. They said, let's build the temple first. Here we are 2,000 years after they rejected the Messiah, and they did it backwards. They went and they built the city, but they still haven't built their temple yet. It's almost like they put God last. 
Isn't that wild? Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like the Bible's written for a reason. They should be reading it. And they should have said, we ought to put him first. I don't think they did. So here we go. He confessed their sins. What was the sin of Israel that led to it becoming desolate? Idol worship and rebellion against the law of Moses. They did not keep the Old Testament law. God told Israel that they would go into captivity in Babylon. Go to Isaiah 39. I just want to uh, take a little time here to show you this. Um, my thinking is if God told them this, there's things that God told us too in the New Testament. So a lot of people read the Bible and it's like, oh, that's just a history book. All that's past. No, I think these are history lessons for us to show us how to live our lives. Amen. Amen. So Isaiah 39, 5 through 8, it says, Then said Isaiah to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, that, behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. We saw that's what happened to Daniel. They took away his ability to have children. That's what they do to a eunuch. Then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. He said, Moreover, for there shall be peace and truth in my days. Now that's very selfish. Hezekiah heard that prophecy and he said, Oh, that's going to happen in the future. Well, that's good. I'm going to be okay. What a selfish person. Does he not care about his posterity? In America today, they don't care. They just keep running up the debt. They don't care that the sons and grandsons will have to go through something. That's a selfish, selfish person. Now, Jeremiah also prophesies. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 50. And basically what I wanted to do is just, just run other verses until we get to next week, which will be so awesome. But I just want you to think about, because this is what I thought about, because the 4th of July came, how so much we have in common as Americans with them back then. And they fell into apostasy. They, they worshiped idols. They didn't follow the law. What's America doing? They're not following the laws of the land, and they watch American Idol. <laughs> All right? <laughs> no, but isn't it weird how they make idols out of people and worship people? Like, yeah. like, this president's the smartest man ever, and he's all there, and he's so sweaty. And you watch him, and it's just like, blah, 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 blah. and you're like, what's this? You know what I mean? So, Jeremiah chapter 50, let's look again at some of the prophecies of the destruction of Babylon. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 1. And the word that the Lord spake against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet, declare ye among the nations and publish and set up a standard. Publish, isn't that funny? America is so great because we have a published standard, the Bible. <laughs> isn't that interesting? And conceal not. Say, Babylon is taking, Bel is confounded, Merodach is broken in pieces, Murdoch. Her idols are confounded, her images are broken in pieces. Remember I told you who Bel was and Murdoch and these people? For out of the north there cometh up a nation against her, which shall make her desolate, her land desolate, and none shall dwell therein. They shall remove, they shall depart, both men and beast. <laughs> Remember? What did it say? He put the heart of a beast in Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. This is way before it actually happened. And God sees it and writes it in the Bible. In those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, and they and the children of Judah together going and what? Weeping. They shall go and seek the Lord their God. They shall ask the way to Zion with their faces, thitherward saying, Come and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. So they're weeping and wanting their land back. Don't you think we want our land back? We want our country back? Seems like it's been hijacked and taken from us, isn't it? My people hath been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. The Old Testament, well, that would be the priest, right? But in the New Testament, who's the shepherd? It's a preacher, a pastor. Are our pastors preaching the truth? No, they're preaching liberation theology. You know what that is? Communism. They're preaching um, the woke agenda which, by the way, is against what the Bible says. If you just look at the Bible and look at that, it doesn't take a, a brain surgeon to go, wow, that just seems like all they listed right there is we don't believe the Bible, and it says this over here. It says the opposite. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. All that found them have devoured them, and their adversary said, We offend not, because they have sinned against the Lord, the habitation of justice, even the Lord, the hope of their fathers." Israel is all about their forefathers. What's so neat about America? What do we remember on July 4th? Our founding fathers. 
There's such a correlation between America and Israel. It's just, it's so amazing. Remove out of the midst of Babylon and go forth out of the land of the Chaldeans and be as the he-goats before the flock. <laughs> Who was the he-goat? We saw that was Alexander. And God's saying, Jews, I'm going to let you leave Babylon and go back and you'll be like a he-goat when you go back there. For lo, I will rise and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country. And they shall set themselves in array against her from thence. She shall be taken. Their arrows shall be as of a mighty expert man. None shall return in vain. And Chaldea shall be a spoil. All that spoil her shall be satisfied, saith the Lord. Uh, skip to verse 13 through 15. Because of the wrath of the Lord, it shall not be inhabited, but it shall be wholly desolate. Everyone that goeth to Babylon shall be astonished and hiss at all her plagues. Man, could you imagine going to Babylon and you're just walking through the land and you're like <laughs> hissing because there's foxes, there's snakes, there's bears. There's, I mean, you're just, it's a dangerous country. That's how God judged it. That's funny. Put yourselves in array against Babylon round about, all ye that bend the bow, shoot at her, spare no arrows, for she has sinned against the Lord. So God judged Israel for sinning against the Lord. Then Babylon takes her over and sins against the Lord, so he judges Babylon. Verse 15, shout against her round about. <laughs> I just, I don't know, 4th of July just came and I think about the shot heard round the world. And here's the shout heard round about. <laughs> it's just almost the same word, shout, shoot, I don't know. She hath given her hand, her foundations are fallen, her walls are thrown down, for it is the vengeance of the Lord. Take vengeance upon her as she hath done, do unto her. Now verse 17 through 20. Israel is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. Babylon was what? They had a lion. Remember, we looked at that. That was their main thing. What's, what's America's main thing? An eagle. Which, by the way, Rome was an eagle. It says, uh, First the king of Assyria hath devoured him, and last this Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon hath broken his bones. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I punish the king of Babylon and his land as I have punished the king of Assyria. And I will bring Israel again to his habitation, and he shall feed on Carmel and Bashan. By the way, I got to see the Mount Carmel when I was in Israel, and we went to Bashan. We drove through it. Beautiful place, beautiful place, except for the minefields. <laughs> We're driving down the road, and I'm like, that's a barbed wire fence. What's that little yellow uh, little sign? He goes, oh, that says, don't go in there, minefield. <laughs> and then there's the border of Lebanon right there. So Bashan is beautiful, except for the minefields, you know. And his soul shall be satisfied upon a Mount Ephraim and Gilead. In those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none, and the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. So God, 70 years later, says, Now, I'm going to pardon them. I'm going to let them go back to their nation. If he did it once, do you think he's going to do it again? There are people out there that believe in replacement theology. God's done with the Jews. Then why is there the nation of Israel all over again? Because he ain't done with them. He made a promise and he told them forever. When God says forever, he means forever. So God used Babylon to discipline Israel. And then he used the Medes and Persians to discipline Babylon. And then because they were wicked and evil, he used Alexander the Great. To discipline them. And because Alexander the Great was evil and he thought he was a god. Did you know that? I forgot to say that I think when we, when we studied him. Uh, he went to Egypt and they told him that you're a god. So he thought he was an Egyptian god or something. Um, then God judged Greece. And so every nation better serve God or else God's going to build a bigger nation to go against them. And maybe America needs to remember it says in God we trust on our money. So maybe that's why they're trying to get rid of our money and do the CBDC or whatever. Um, history, repeated. history repeats itself. I can't say, it, can't say it any better. Turn with me real quick to Psalms 137. This might be what I mentioned earlier. It's in my notes here. Psalms 137. So I just want you to know that as we're looking at what Daniel says, Daniel's trying to make sense of all this. And why did it take him nine chapters to go, you know, maybe I should go read Jeremiah. <laughs> you think he would have already been reading it. But all of a sudden he's like, maybe I should go read Jeremiah. Maybe that applies to me. And now he's seeing, oh yeah, God prophesied all this. And imagine him thinking, wow, God put me right in the middle of some of the greatest kings in the entire history of the world. And he's put me right here to be a, a light and a testimony to all these guys. 
and he took me out of here, out of Jerusalem, to put me there to protect me and save me from being destroyed. Isn't that incredible? So um, he probably got goosebumps so big a pig could suck on him as he's reading through here is what I'm thinking. But anyway, it says in Psalm 137, verse 1 through 9, and here's, here's the Jews, what they said. Here's, here's the verse I mentioned earlier. By the rivers of Babylon, you know that song? There we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing unto us one of the songs of Zion. Boy, at least they remembered their heritage and who they were and their songs. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem who said, Raise it, raise it. What does that mean? Raise it to the ground, burn it down, even to the foundations thereof. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. <sighs> That's kind of hard to be happy about. But uh, it's interesting. That was David, one of the songs of David. And it was like he was reliving what they went through before they got to come back and rebuild their city. Which happened when? Um, well, don't know. That was, that was a prophecy because David was about 1,000 B.C., wasn't he? So he's writing that, and that's a prophecy of when we do go into captivity and we're in Babylon. So the Bible is full of prophecy. Now let's go back to Daniel and see if we can finish this thing up. Um, I put this together a week ago, <laughs> and I've just been holding on to it, but uh, I like it to be fresh, like I just studied for it, but I've been going so much and traveling. So back to Daniel chapter 9. So he's praying there in verse 4, and he says, we want to keep the covenant. We broke the law, now we want to keep the law. Verse 5, he gives his confession. We have sinned and committed iniquity and have done wickedly. I mean, three times, that's three different ways of saying we did wrong. We done bad. That's what he's saying. We done bad. And it says, and have done wickedly and have rebelled. Now, four times. Even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. And then he says, neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. So he's saying, hey, we didn't listen to Jeremiah. We didn't listen to Isaiah. We didn't. Isn't that amazing that God warned them several times over and different prophets and they didn't listen? Um, well, I guess we have to go to Micah chapter 4 and verse 10. So go with me to Micah chapter 4 and verse 10. This is an interesting verse. Micah. So start with Malachi and work backwards till you can find Micah. Micah chapter 4. In verse 10. I know it's in the Bible. I saw it the other day. And you know, Micah chapter 4 and verse 10. Here is amazing. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. There shalt thou be delivered, for the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. Now imagine reading that in about 700 before Christ. And then you go into Babylon as a captive. And you're like, wow, God said that would happen, but He's going to deliver us. But you're not reading the rest of the Bible. He said for 70 years. So you're clinging on to that verse. He's going to deliver us. And for 70 years you keep thinking He is, and nothing happened. You think they kind of had some doubts? You think they kind of... You think that's why the false prophets came up and said, No, man, the rapture's coming this year. I mean, I'm sorry, the, 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 the leaving of, of Babylon's coming this year. And they got discouraged. But if they'd read their Bible, they would have known exactly when God would start dealing with them. That's why I think maybe the Bible has the date of the rapture. Because God gave them all that back then to know when something's going to happen. He must have given it. Now, I don't know what it is. But I'm saying I bet it's in there. Because He tells you it'll be this many days till this... So it's got to be there somewhere, you know, but it's all there in the Bible. God doesn't ever leave anyone in the dark. He's going to tell you exactly what's going to happen. And if you'll just obey him, you'll be prepared for it. Isn't that a good God? Yes. I think so. I think so. So back to Daniel chapter nine. So he said, we have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Verse six, neither have we hearkened to thy servants, the prophets. 
So we got Jeremiah, we got Isaiah, and we got Micah. At least those three prophets. There's probably more. I don't have time to get into those. Now skip to verse 7. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day, to the men of Judah and of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel that are near and that are far off. Through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass, they have trespassed against thee. Now, where did they go? Well, they went to Babylon. I guess they might have gone to some other countries too. They fled when they saw him coming. But this sounds like a prophecy of today too. Whenever Jerusalem fell here, they went all over the world. And all over the world there were Jews. And then they all came back around 1947 and then on. And they're all coming back. And if you're Jewish, you can move to Israel today. And you can do what's called an Aliyah. Have you ever heard of the Aliyah? Mm -hmm. Aliyah is if you're Jewish and you want to live in your homeland, you go to them, you say, I'm Jewish, I want to start my Aliyah. And they give you training and they set you up and teach you so you can become now an Israeli citizen who lives in the land and can have a job. And first thing you need to do is learn the language. Somehow, <laughs> our GPS turned from English to Hebrew. So we're trying to drive all over South Carolina. We're hearing, <laughs> What is it, Laura? What's the word? Do you remember? Uh, I'm an anamim or something. Uh, turn left or turn right. And he kept saying it over and over. And it was just like, so it's a weird language. And it takes some time to learn that language. And I've, I've learned some, but that <laughs> And it sounds like a cat's, you know, spitting up a, a hairball. It's, it, it's, uh, it's interesting, but we had to listen to that for a whole week. We're like, but, uh, what is it? I can, it's on the tip of my tongue what that was saying, the GPS she was saying. But anyway, it was funny. But that's one of the things. You've got to learn the language. So what's amazing about Israel is they speak today, almost 2,500 years later, the same language that he spoke back then. That language is the longest spoken language in the history of the world. And so if you're Jewish and you want to become a citizen of Israel, you can do your aliyah. Okay, so then it says, verse 7, O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day, to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel that are near and that are far off, through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against thee. So I think that's a double application, not just back then, but also after they rejected the Messiah, they were driven into all the world. Verse 8, O Lord, to us belong confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. When you sin, you don't just sin against someone else. Every time you sin, you sin against God. Is that right? That's what the Bible says. Amen. Now verse 9, to the Lord our God belong mercies and forgivenesses. That's an interesting word, forgivenesses. Though we have rebelled against Him, neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in His ways, which He set before us by His servants, the prophets. Now, I'm going to be honest, I don't like it when people talk like that. I don't like to hear, we in America, we've gone the wrong way, we did wrong, we, we, I'm like, we? I'm not. <laughs> I'm not doing wrong. I, I hate that they say we, but when you're part of that country, you're part of them. But it just, it, it just bothers me. It's like, America this, America that, we, we, we. I'm like, not me. <laughs> I'm like the guy trying to stand against it. But that's the way he's talking. He's confessing his sin, but also the sin of his whole country. I just want to ask you, when you go to the Lord in prayer every night or every morning, when you wake up, would you remember to pray for your country? And say, Lord, we as a country are wrong. Make us right. And please help we, the people, to get right with you. All right. So, neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in His ways, which He set before us by His servants, the prophets. Now, yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. So where is that curse written? That's what I was trying to find. So all the best I can come up with is Leviticus chapter 26. So let's go back there. Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus chapter 26, and I want to finish here, but... We're going to read a lot of this because I want you to see if this was God speaking to Israel saying this, and this is what He'd do to them, imagine what He'd do to America 
if they turn against him. Leviticus 26, 14. But if ye will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror. What happened on 9-11? A bunch of terrorists. Or was it? <laughs> Inside job. <clears throat> but anyway, um, <laughs> consumption and the burning ague that shall consume the eyes and, shall, and cause sorrow of heart. And ye shall sow your seed in vain and your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you and you shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. Whew. Skip down to verse 21. And if you walk contrary to me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. You thought COVID was bad. Imagine six more of those. In verse 25, And I will bring a sword upon you and shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when ye are gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you, and ye shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. Uh, skip to verse 31. And I will make your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries unto desolation. And I will not smell the savor of your sweet odors. And I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the heathen, and will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. Boy, what could lay a land desolate? Somebody shot nukes. And what are they talking about? <laughs> talking about stuff like that. Verse 29, And they that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity in your enemies' hands. And also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. Uh, verse 40, If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers which their with their trespass which they trespass against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then... Will I remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham? Will I remember and I will remember the land? Skip to verse 44. And yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. These are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord made between them, between him and the children of Israel in Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. So the Old Testament law was a, if you do this, then I will do this. Mm -hmm. If you do contrary, then I will do this. So America, do you think America is going contrary to what God says in the Bible, how a nation yes. should be? It's kind of sad, isn't it? It's kind of sad. All right. Daniel chapter 9. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand the truth. So, getting away from sin, but also understanding the truth. Verse 14, Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all His works which He doeth, for we obey not His voice. God doesn't do evil, does He? But did you see verse 13? All this evil has come upon us. It wasn't God that did them evil. They did evil, so God says, well, then I'm backing away. I'm taking this hedge of protection away. Now you watch these guys come take you over and do the evil. God didn't do that. God is righteous. But they deserved that because of their sin, didn't they? Some people try to say, well, God sinned, and He did evil to them. No, He didn't. He backed away and let the evil happen because they're doing evil against God. That means when you're doing right, God kind of has a little hedge over you, doesn't he? He kind of protects you a little bit when you're doing right. When you quit, he just goes, oh, okay, see what happens now. Oh, boy, that ought to scare you into wanting to do right. Now, verse 15. And now, O Lord our God, that has brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with the mighty hand, it has gotten thee renowned as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. I'm like, man, speak for yourself. <laughs> Quit putting me in there. We, 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 you know. Anyway, O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. 
what is he doing here? He's like, Lord, we're so wrong. We did wrong. We didn't obey the law. Yes, we deserve it. But he kind of, I'm, I'm sure he kind of went like this a little. But for the sake of your city, would you remember? I mean, you ever do that? That's like a kid. The kid always finds that one little soft spot, you know, where he can get something from mommy and daddy. Does he, does he do that? I love you, daddy. Oh, okay, here's a candy bar, you know. So he's reading his Bible. He's like, God said that that city was made by God, and that's where he'll put his name, and that's where God, that's, that's, that's God's city. So he's just praying, that, oh, we did wrong, we did. But would you just remember your city? Would you remember us for your city? Like, he's kind of going, would you please let us go back there now? Does that see how he's doing this? Uh, no, he's not manipulating God, but he's learned how to pray the right way <laughs> and ask for the right things, is what it sounds like. Now, therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate. That's amazing. Because in the book of Revelation, the book of Matthew, it talks about the desolation, the, uh, the abomination of desolation. There will be a time in the future when it will be desolate again. And that's in the tribulation. But here it's desolate now. And he's asking for the sanctuary. So he's asking for two things. God, rebuild your city and rebuild your sanctuary where the temple would be. And when you look at history, the first decree was go rebuild your sanctuary. Put God first. And then it took a while and several other decrees and several other guys. Now you go back and build the city. But it started 70 years after, just like it said in the Bible. So that's amazing. But it took something like 91 years to go from the temple to... Oh, and, and by the way, how long did it take to rebuild all this? 49 years. 7 times 7. There's a number 7. I did this study and we'll look at that next week. But I'm just... I was looking at that, and I said, I wonder how long it took for them to rebuild all that. And it said 49 years, and I was just like, God always uses that number seven, seven times seven, until they got that all thing. Man, that was cool. That can't be a coincidence. So, verse uh, 18, O oh my God, incline thine ear, he says, open thine eyes, and behold our desolations, and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. Sounds like he's praying and saying the right thing. He's not just saying it because he knows that's what he's supposed to say. He's, he means it from the heart. And so, not our righteousnesses in our lands are desolate. Isaiah 64, let's go there. Isaiah chapter 64. I quoted this verse earlier. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. <laughs> or did it take them to Babylon? And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee, for thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. He hid his face from them, so what is Daniel saying? Lord, open your eyes and look at us again. Isn't that something? But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou art potter. And we are all the work of thy hand. Be not wroth, very sore, O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy people. Here's we again. <laughs> thy holy cities are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem a what? Desolation. Our holy and our beautiful house, where our fathers praise thee, is burned up with fire, and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Wilt thou refrain thyself for these things, O Lord? Wilt thou hold thy peace and afflict us very sore? So it sounds like he read his Bible. He's going back and reading Jeremiah and Isaiah, and it sounds like he's saying, well, I see what the problem is. We rebelled against God, and then we forgot to pray, and we forgot to seek his face, and we forgot to ask God, Lord, uh, please remember us and help us to get back there because we do want to worship you. Can you worship God in Babylon? Well, I guess, but it's not the place where he said to worship. It's not where they're supposed to be. So back to Daniel chapter 9, and we'll finish this up. Daniel chapter 9. For thy city and thy people are called by thy name. Verse 20, And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord, 
my God, for the holy mountain of my God. Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the, in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening, evening oblation. So here is who? This is the archangel Gabriel. But in the Bible, angels appear as men. So that's why it says the man. And then it goes there and it says, And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. And so he's about to give him verse 23 to 27, which we're going to look at next time. Now, I don't know if I have that skill and understanding because I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> uh, the math I can't get. I can't figure out the math, but it is as close to 483 years as I can get it. But I'll show you that next time, how it definitely is talking about this last decree and what they're doing and they're rebuilding. But I like things perfect. I wish I could give you perfect, but I can just get, I can just do an estimate. That's all I can do. I can estimate and show you that it does come out to exactly what it says. But he to give you skill and understanding, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. And what he's about to give him, I guess, is the vision. But he says, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth. What commandment? For him to come tell him something. So God answered Daniel's prayer. Isn't that amazing? He said the right things the right way. He confessed his sin, and then he said, Now, not for my sake, Lord, but remember your promise? Well, if you don't do this, you're breaking your promise, Lord. And God's like, Yeah, I know. And he's like, Lord, remember how we used to worship you on your holy mountain? I mean, it's all about you, Lord. Don't, don't you want us to do it your way? I mean, wow, he really got the Lord, you know, like, God's in heaven going, All right, Daniel. Uh, what is it, Gabriel? Was it Gabriel? Gabriel, come here. He's right. Come on. Yeah, let's get down there and tell him this now. <laughs> How come that hadn't happened before, though, in those 70 years? Where was everybody? Why weren't they praying? They were all down at the river crying, <laughs> I guess, and playing songs. Oh, we're in captivity. Life stinks and then you die. Oh, I wish we were back home. I'm sure, I'm sure the country music scene in Babylon was pretty good, you know. I'm just a poor old Jew in Babylon, you know, probably something. But why weren't they praying like he prayed? Why did it take them 70 years to finally confess their sin? Isn't that something? Have you thought about that? I mean, surely there were other Jews that would have been praying the same thing for those 70 years. Why did God wait till then to say, come here, Gabriel? All right, because of his prayer. It sounds like there wasn't anybody else praying. He wanted them to learn. He, he did, but where were all the other people praying? That's my question if you don't get anything else out of this. Hey, America, are you praying? Are you confessing your sin? Are you asking God, please come at the rapture and get us out of this mess because we know your wrath's about to come in the tribulation. Anytime, Lord, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but for you, so we can worship with you in your holy mountain. Of, I mean, remember us, Lord, because we remember you. I just think there needs to be more true Christians in America praying and asking Jesus to come. So, he says, And I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. What an amazing thing. He is great. You know, there's three men in the Bible. Job, Daniel, and who was the other one? Daniel, Job, and Noah are the three guys in the Bible that God says were like up here in his eyes. They were the ones. That... Daniel is one of the most beloved people in the whole Bible. Now put yourself in Daniel's shoes. Did he have a right to be in the dumps and be bitter his whole life? Man, I didn't even get to stay in the city and worship God, man. I have to live over here. He had a right to just live in the dumps and, and, and not be what he should have been. But he, he said, no, I'm going to be even better than what I should be because I must be here for a reason. And I bet after he wrote the book of Daniel, he, he goes, wow, did God use me or what? I just got the vision of the history of the whole world, and I got to write it down for people to see. So you might be in a place you don't want to be. Well, you shouldn't get in the dumps. You should be thankful because you have an opportunity for God to use you. And He can use you in a mighty way if your heart is right. And God loves people 
who are doing right no matter what. Wow, I might start preaching here in a minute, so I better <laughs> wrap this thing up, right? Let me say this. He says, consider the vision. Understand the matter and consider the vision. What vision? What we'll read next time, verse 24 to 26, it's basically, here's what's going to happen in the future, in the next 483 years. And there's no beast mentioned this time. <laughs> I find that fascinating. No beast, or is there? Well, maybe there is a beast mentioned because the Antichrist shows up in the last of those seven years, and the book of Revelation calls him a beast. So, kind of interesting to see so many times a beast is mentioned. But uh, next time we'll get into this, and man, that's, that's what I've been dreading because it's so hard to figure that out, and I'll just do the best I can. I like exact. I want to give you like... I want to go, so here's 483 years, so to the minute, to the hour, to the day, here's what, and, and I can't, all I can do is say, well, it's about 483 years. I can't get that thing as exact as I can, but I'll get it as close as I can, and it's hard to do that because guess what? We have the Gregorian calendar, we got the other calendar, we got the lunar days, we got the solar days, we got, so I'm not good at math either, right? Two plus two is what now? Is it? Is it like 4.8 or something? See, I'm not good at math, so I'm not that good. But I'll do the best I can. I know what other people say about it, but I'll do my best to show you. And as I read through that passage, more and more, I just have more questions. But I did get something, how, how it divides it up to seven years and then this many years. And so I'm looking forward to next week. I hope it's be a blessing when I'm not as tired. I have four hours sleep last night driving all the way from South Carolina. But next week is going to be fun, and we'll get more time to go into this whole prophecy because that prophecy, that vision we're going to read is about what's happening from here to here, but that last seven years is out here after the rapture. And how anybody could say that the book of Daniel is all past makes me wonder if they know God from a cantaloupe because, no, that book of Revelation ties into the book of Daniel. And it tells us that last seven years, and it has to be that last seven years of Daniel. And remember, Daniel is writing to his people, Israel. So that's not even to us. So we're just a little parentheses in between because they rejected the Messiah. Take us out, then you got 483, and then you've got that final seven years, which is called the time of Jacob's trouble. And then you have Jesus coming back to rule and reign for a thousand years. 